Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, as Sarah said, the one thing that sticks with you is whenever a crime happens is that you don't want this to happen to another family. And that has been my passion. Um, I lost my son, Gavin, in July of 2022. And I'd never heard of the crime pr previously. As I started to dive in, I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue. I just won my primary. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go into politics. Um, and my wife said, you're one of the few people with a voice that can actually get up there and do something. Um, so since I've came to Columbia, that has been my number one goal is coming in. Um, I've dove, dove in. As they say, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. I can definitely say that is true. Um, and trying to understand how our justice system works. I've seen it from afar with victims like we have for the family of Larry Vaughn that's here today out of Rock Hill in my area. I've seen how it doesn't appear to be fair. And I've seen that we have a lot of work to do. Um, as I've come in, I'm one of the few freshmen on the Judiciary Committee. Within my first week, I would say the thing that I was shocked about the most was the way that we select our judges. I don't believe that it's fair. Um, not that I believe a popularity contest is the way to go. But I do believe that judicial reform should be at the top of all of our lists. So I urge each and every one of you to stay in touch with your representatives and your senators to urge and push forward judicial reform. We have many bills um, out there. I just co-sponsored one last week from another freshman um, that filed it, Representative Joe White. And we've got to get this bill through the House, get it through the Senate, um, and not just provide lip service to our constituents. It's time for some real change. I appreciate everyone coming out today. I don't know the next speaker to introduce, so I apologize. Good morning. As Sarah stated, my name is Dolores Boyce, and my son, Damian Melvin Green, was murdered August the 6th, 2015. I am a person of faith who worked my son's case alongside my family tirelessly. The justice system as a whole failed me and my family. We trusted a system who let us down to the point where in the end, the faith in the judicial system doesn't exist to me because it doesn't work for victims, only accused criminals or high profile victims. It took SLED and the solicitor's office four years and three months to call me and my family in to inform us that warrants would be issued in this case. We were told by the solicitor's office that this was one of the hardest work cases they had seen in a while. He was told us that they had two eyewitnesses that saw the perpetrators go into Damien's home heard gunshots, and saw the perpetrators leave Damien's home. It was daylight, so this was supposed to be open and shut. However, it was anything but. From day one to this point, SLED had no new evidence, no physical evidence was ever found. Everything was exactly the same from 2015 to 2019. So my question is, why didn't an arrest happen earlier? I'll tell you what they were doing, nothing. But my family and myself continued working Damien's case. Judges was asking bond hearings, why did it take so long to make an arrest? Or why is it taking so long to bring this case to trial? I remember going to a bond hearing. It was a continuation bond hearing and feeling as if my rights were violated because the judge gave the defendant an opportunity to speak and ignored me. It was as if I wasn't even there. And of course, he was granted bond. A bonding company requested a hearing to part ways with this defendant and stated that the defendant was tampering with the monitor and removing it. 
They wanted to sever their relationship. The judge granted them that. But however, the judge took away the anchor monitor completely and lowered the bond. Uh, yes, a criminal was rewarded for breaking the law again. One of the defendants was allowed out on bond and it wasn't until I investigated and notified the prosecutor that he committed a crime in Casey, South Carolina and was a fugitive there. And finally, the bond was revoked. In 2019, four years after my son's death, warrants went out for the defendants. The case went to trial seven years later. In February 2023, we were notified of a bond hearing. The defendant's lawyer, the state's no, the, the defendant's lawyer announced that the state's primary witness was dead. The bombshell was dropped. The solicitor's office sat on this case so long, not one, but two witnesses died seven years apart. I have never been given a legitimate answer on several things in this case, and it's sad. We were called to the solicitor's office in February 2023 to let us know that without the primary eyewitnesses, the case would be dismissed. Things seemed wrong early on during this case, so I sought help through SC Van. And I would like to take the opportunity at this moment to thank them for the countless hours that they have helped me and given me confirmation that my thoughts were correct the judicial system is broken. Victims are barely included in the process. The system is designed for accused criminals or high profile victims. I left broken and without even an apology. It is my prayer that this system gets fixed. It is my prayer that there needs to be no bond for accused murderers and also when these murder trials come to court, that there are someone, a mutual party, that's able to sit in on these trials and make sure that victims are getting what they deserve, making sure the judges are not violating our rights, ensuring that we get a fair chance to allow our family members' legacies to live on. Because at this point, we are failed. We are being failed terribly through the justice system. Thank you. Good morning. Before I begin, I would like to thank Sarah Ford and her staff at SC Van for having me here today to speak. More importantly, I would like to thank you all for being here this morning. Your presence gives me hope, hope that the majority of my fellow South Carolinians are ready for change and ready to fight for victims. Our family's story begins on a fall night in October of 2018. On that night, our daughter, Dallas Hayes Stoller, attended a party in Barenberg County, South Carolina. On that night, she became a victim of sexual assault. Little did I know this would be the beginning of the end of our beautiful daughter. As a little over three years later, she would succumb to a self-inflicted injury. Dallas was a beautiful young lady with loads of potential, a bright future and a heart as big as the world itself. After that fateful night, I watched a system, a system I so strongly believed in, aid in destroying our child's life and severely injuring the lives of two other young ladies who are also victims in this case. I watched the good old boy system start its engines and work its magic for a well-connected defendant. I watched as a third young lady became a victim exactly 41 days later at the hands of this defendant while he was out on unmonitored bond for the sexual assault of our daughter. 
I watched as a sitting South Carolina state senator stood in a courtroom in Orangeburg County, South Carolina and publicly slut shamed this young lady. I watched the deputy solicitor of the second judicial circuit drop our daughter's case because she was no longer here to face her attacker. Lastly, in April of 2022, I watched a circuit court judge allow this defendant to walk away with a five-year probationary sentence for assault and battery first degree, no sex offender registry, and an ability to have his record fully expunged once he completed the terms of his probation. That, my friends, is what justice for victims looks like here in South Carolina. Out front in the public eye, our courts, some solicitors, some attorneys, etc., say openly, victims matter. They argue this whole lawyer legislator thing and the way we appoint our judges has no impact on justice for our victims. They argue we are only making noise because things didn't work out for our daughter and other victims. I say they are very wrong. We have been silent for exactly a year now. We have been silent because we were asked to be. We were told our silence would allow the Second Judicial Circuit's Solicitor's Office to take a second look at Dallas's case. Admitting privately, to a degree, they had made mistakes regarding her case. Well, folks, this is what our Ask For Silence has earned us so far. To date, we have received one call from their office, and it appears, based on that conversation, we are no further along than we were a year ago. That conversation has left us with even less hope anything will ever be done. I want to say publicly how very proud I am of Dallas's sisters, Brett and Carly for taking on this fight on behalf of not only their late sister, but also fighting for all victims in our state. Their passion for this fight has ignited a flame in me and I pray has done the same for you all. I pray their courage has given you the courage to say publicly enough is enough, that you are no longer willing to accept things as they are and stand ready to fight alongside us to ensure victims are no longer victimized by our system. I implore each and every one of you to fight for real change. Remember, evil knows no boundaries. Evil cares nothing about the balance in your bank account, where you live, how well you were raised, who you know or what you believe your social standing is. I'm saying no one is exempt from becoming a victim when evil comes knocking. I pray evil never comes to visit you. I pray none of you have to feel or live with what we have to. However, if you do become a victim, I pray together we have made positive change and future Victims will be treated with compassion and understanding, not be treated the way many victims are, are today and not have your rights violated. In closing, I want all our representatives and senators to know we are fighters and no longer will accept things as they are. I've taught my girls to stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. I've taught them to stand up for what is right Always remember, a strong person fights for themselves. A stronger person fights for others. We, as a family, are stronger people and will continue to fight for our late daughter, Dallas, and all victims. We will be silent no longer. Justice for her, justice for Dallas, justice for Chloe, justice for all. Thank you. My name is Sandy Smith. I'm the mother of Stephen Smith. 
Stephen was killed on July 8th of 2015, and his homicide remains unsolved. Stephen was kind. Stephen was smart. Stephen was buried in his medical scrubs because he was on track to become a doctor so that he could help others. But he never got that chance because someone killed him. For eight years, we have been fighting for Stephen to get the answers in his case. I don't know how to fix the problem that led to my son's murder being mishandled from the beginning, but I do know that I am thankful to have so many wonderful people helping me to get justice for Stephen. Mandy Batney is joining me here as a friend, but also as an advocate for change. And she has some words to share. Great job, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. My name is Mandy Matney. I'm a journalist and an advocate for victims. When I met Sandy in 2019, I was appalled at how public agencies were failing Sandy, failing Stephen, and failing South Carolina. As we dove deeper into Stephen's case, I learned about so many other families who were also failed by public systems that are supposed to protect them or at the very least provide equal footing. Yet it seems too often these failures are designed by powerful people in pursuit of unequal applications of justice. Our state house belongs to each of us South Carolinians. And we are here to remind our legislators that each member of our statewide community deserves the same access and benefits of our legal and law enforcement systems. Sandy Smith deserved to have her son's homicide investigated zealously. Dallas Stoller deserved to have law enforcement and the solicitor's office take her seriously. And when local agencies fail victims, it's up to the state to hold local agencies accountable, not provide cover. And when, local and when any local agencies fails, we in the media exist to light the lamps that expose those failures wherever the truth may lead. We give up individual liberty in exchange for the promise that these systems will keep us safe. And this exchange is made with public trust. Each time the justice system overlooks incompetence, collusion, or corruption, that public trust is compromised. Every time someone with access, power, or money manipulates the system to their advantage, public trust is compromised. It's time that we all demand one system of justice, not one for the powerful and another for everyone else. Heinous crimes are committed every day. And there are so many who work tirelessly on the behalf of the victims left in the wake. It seems like our systems are not impervious to a corruption that rots trust from within. Crime and corruption are not always walking hand in hand, but they are often lurking in the shadows where sunlight fails to shine. Thank you, Sandy, Carl, and Dolores for sharing your bravery. It is a beacon of light to countless others seeking justice. And thank you to all of you who are here today who wish to make South Carolina change for the better, for the victims. Thank you. First, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, when I decided to run for a state house, by the way, I am the oldest freshman ever elected to the South Carolina State House. I was 76 when I ran, and I'm 77 now. My number one issue was judicial reform. And I'll say this about judicial reform. Victims will never be treated fairly by any bill that's passed to help victims until judges are selected properly and they are fair judges. 
We are the only state in America that elects our judges the way we do. That should tell you that we're not doing it the right way. We have a Judicial Merit Selection Commission consisting of 10 people. Five of them are appointed by the Speaker of the House. Five of them are appointed by the Senate. Out of that 10, eight of them are criminal defense attorneys. You have to go through that committee to get approved to be a judge in South Carolina. That means that those eight criminal defense attorneys have to approve who their judges are going to be, who they will plead cases in front of. That is a wrong system. <clears throat> Out of those eight criminal defense attorneys, six of them are also lawyer legislators who sit either in the Senate or in the House. They have more power than any of us will ever have. When I ran for office, I told everybody, we the people can. But what I've learned, a reporter asked me about a month ago, what have you learned in your first month at the State House? I said, well, you know, we're taught when we're kids that America is government of the people, by the people, and for the people. What I've learned in a month is that government here is of the powerful, by the powerful, and for the powerful. It, it is up to us, and, and I always, I'm not Trump, but I like to address the media. Because if the media would bring attention to how we do this in South Carolina, the media could get it stopped. Unless and until we, as the people, raise enough cane, we're not going to get this thing stopped. Here's the problem. When you go campaigning, you know what everybody complains about? They complain about the roads. Some of them complain about education. Very few of them complain about the judicial system because until your daughter is raped and ends up committing suicide, until your son is murdered, until a lady out here, your brother is murdered and, and the murder is put out on bond for $250,000, until that happens, you don't care. It's time that we started caring about these victims and we put people in, first of all, elect some people that will stand up to this JMSC mess. Secondly, stop the mess of the JMSC. We've got the governor saying he wants to change it. We've got the attorney general saying he wants to change it. My bill, H4183, isn't the complete answer, but it says that lawyer legislators cannot serve on the JMSC anymore. And it says, and it says the governor would have the right to appoint some people, not just the head of the Senate and not just the head of the House. So I ask you to, to look at H4183. I've got 34 sponsors. It's never coming out of committee until we, the people, say it's got to come out of committee. So I thank you. I apologize to all the victims this morning for the fact that our judicial system has failed you. And I just want all of us to pray together and work together to change this injustice system. Thank you. Mr. Stoller, it's a real pleasure to be speaking with you. Uh, thank you for keeping up the fight. It's now a year after we were on these same State House steps. What has changed in that time? Well, absolutely, um, Dylan, thank you for having me here and thank you for speak, allowing me to speak again. Um, well, actually, nothing, nothing has happened. Um, we've, um, we've met with the Second Judicial Circuit Solicitor's Office. One time had a phone call about four weeks ago, maybe five now, I forget, time flies. Um, and basically all we learned in that conversation was that in a nutshell, we're no further along than we were a year ago when we met with Solicitor Weeks in Aiken County and agreed to lay off for a bit to see, let this give them a chance to work. And uh, so at this point, what we've learned is a couple witnesses have changed their stories or either don't recall what they said four and a half years ago. Um, and um, we also learned that our daughter was extremely intoxicated when she was at that party, which we already knew. Um, and I don't think we ever took the occasion not to make that public from the onset. So we didn't hide that. But to Sarah Ford was SC Van, that's, that's still not a, you can be drunk. That doesn't mean you consent to a, a sexual assault. So that's, but nothing in a nutshell has happened in a year, basically. No material changes despite them asking for you to give them the space to, to do some more work? No, sir. Not in my opinion. That's, again, that was a, what I just told you a moment ago. That was a recap of what that conversation was. It lasted about 30 minutes, but that's a, a good summary of it. You know, Dallas was drunk and witnesses have changed their testimony. 
I mean, I, I remember that being a part of the story when we initially covered it, so I don't, I don't think that you're misrepresenting that at all. Right. Fortunately, though there hasn't been much change in your case personally, the movement which you and your family through great personal pain uh, helped to create here in South Carolina seems to have grown. Uh, other families which are in similar positions today, right where we're standing, got to address a crowd that is here for the second year in a row because it now seems that the public is coming to a broader realization that this is not a problem isolated to uh, just one senator, Senator Hutto, in, in your instance, or even just the Senate or the House. It, it's, it's multiple of these lawyer legislators. I think Representative Todd Rutherford's gotten his time in the spotlight lately for multiple of his clients having uh, gotten out after his, him assisting them legally and, and gone on to commit further violent crimes. Um, do you think that we're seeing any movement here on the legislative side that excites you? Well, I, I think it was Representative um, White that spoke today. Um, out here somewhere. I, I, I think that's his name, and I apologize if I got it wrong. But I am extremely encouraged by what he had to say. Um, that's actually the first time I've heard anybody really say um, on that level, say, listen, this, this, is, this just doesn't work. Um, and hey, if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, we got to do something different. And it's obvious, it, it, you know, it lends so much to whether you know we, we can argue whether the system is corrupt or not corrupt, et cetera, and so on. But the reality of it is, at the very least, if there is not corruption, it at least lends. It looks that way, you know. And um, I'm not saying that just because I'm a scorned parent who lost a child. I mean, this is this is reality. I'm in law enforcement. I deal with it with victims day in and day out um, when I am working, and uh, you know it's, it's 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 just not it's not positive. But I am happy to see that he did. He has introduced that. I know it's got a long way to go, um, but at least it's that's a start, right? But we need more of our legislators and senators to support it. We need more people to speak out. We need we need to keep that momentum going. Um, I am a little ashamed we were to, we were silent for a year that um, we bought into what we were told and we were which you know I, I believe in fairness and I believe in trying to give people time to work so we gave them that opportunity um, it didn't work out so the, the time to be quiet is over with now and um, that's one of the reasons we are here today to go ahead and get that out there and then there's more coming down the line with that case but um, but yes, yeah, so the, these legislators, these representatives, they need to, you know, Rutherford's got a, I don't know him at all, um, but sounds like he's got a lot of things that he needs to account for. Sounds like he's got a lot of things to account for, for sure. Well, despite your year of silence, the movement that you helped to create has taken uh, leaps and bounds in that time. And it's good to have your loud and uh, articulate voice back on the stage. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for Thank you, Dylan. I'm glad to be here. But I got to give most of my credit for getting that voice rolling and started to Brett Stoller, Tabby to buy my and Carly Gray Stoller, my daughters. They they're real fighters, and they like I said in my presentation, they've ignited a flame that we're not going to let it go out. We're going to try to continue to fight for it as hard as we can. You raised some rights, sir. Thank you very Thank much. You, Dylan.